is here where we bring the collected or captured mosquito or the adult mosquito or larva mosquito to identify and to, if possible, test them for the presence of pathogens such as dengue virus. Uh, we only do screening tests, meaning it still requires confirmatory tests such as by CDC to ensure the results we find are correct. Okay? And I'd like to introduce Ms. Claire Barati. She is the Environmental Public Health Officer 3 with the Division of Environmental Health. She has been tasked to supervise the operation of the Mosquito Lab. And what she'll do for you is basically escort you to this portion of our facility and show you the steps and the areas uh, that we utilize for the part of mosquito surveillance. So the domestic surveillance, that's inclusive of uh, going out, making contact with the, uh, the patients in question, uh, surveying their area, collecting adult mosquitoes, collecting mosquito larvae, uh, bring them back to the uh, lab, rear them, meaning grow them from larvae to adulthood, identify them, uh, then to test them for pathogens such as dengue virus. So with that, I'd like to introduce Claire Barati. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Are you all ready to go into the laboratory? storage room. This is where we hold all of our traps. We have a variety of traps. Um, this is the primary trap that we utilize. It's called the BG2 Sentinel. So if you see this out in the field, anyone in the public, um, please we ask that you leave it alone. Um, our, our staff go out and do the surveillance typically every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Uh, we also set out an oviposit trap. Actually, this, this trap collects adults, adult mosquitoes. Would you like to start maybe share with the public how exactly this trap works sure. out in the field? Sure. So um, this trap is um, equipped with a, a motor, a battery that's inside. The battery, turn, when you, it's on, um, it pushes this down. It creates a negative pressure, and it pushes this down so that mosquitoes go inside. Now, what attracts them is this mosquito lure. And it's quite stinky. Um, I'm not going to say that people who get bitten a lot are stinky, but it is similar to um, what a human being um, gives off, and that's what it uses as an attractant. So we put this out every um, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, like I said, and this is a, the rain shield that keeps water from going inside. So aside from the adult trap, we also do oviposit traps. Well, essentially, I'll show it to you in the laboratory, but essentially it's just a bottle. It's actually a black container, you'll see that out in the field, and that catches eggs. And what we do is we make our own hand fusion, which is essentially stinky water, which has um, hay, pretty much grass cuttings in it, and that's what it also attracts mosquitoes for um, laying eggs. Yes, and I'd like to emphasize that mosquitoes require water to lay its eggs, so that's our em emphasizing the importance of removing artificial containers that may collect water, everything from tires to, to discarded cans and bottles. Uh, it doesn't take much water for them to uh, lay their eggs and have to go through the life cycle and become from a egg to a larva, larvae, pupa, larvae pupa. pupa, then it's adult. So we're trying to break that life cycle by removing their breeding sites. So these are the two different types of traps then? Yes. Right? Correct. Is have, there one more effective than the other? Um, actually, they catch different things. Mm -hmm. So the oviposit isn't really for decision making. We really want to catch adults. Adults tell us what's flying around and what can bite you at the moment. We also have another trap that we set out. Um, it's not set up right now, but this is a CDC light trap. So you'll see this hanging upside down with an igloo cooler and then there's a catch basket and it emits a UV light and so this is set out overnight and then it attracts all different kinds of mosquitoes and everything else too. 
With the BG traps, the first trap that you saw, that one is specific to 80s. 80s particularly like that trap. So that's our, um, our vector of concern is 80s uh, Egypti and 80s Apopictus. But we, don't, we have not recorded any 80s Egypti on island currently. So our focus is essentially catching the 80s species mosquitoes. And uh, part of the surveillance is determining exactly which species are present on island. At the moment, Apopictus and another species which is not a vector concern, at least at the time, is what we've been capturing. We have not captured nor identified Egypti. Now that is not to say it's not existing on island, it just simply means that we have yet to catch one. So we're, uh, we're, we're hopeful that we never catch one. Uh, Aedes aegypti are, are efficient uh, transmitter of the dengue virus and along with other mosquito-borne diseases. But however, albopictus can also transmit the disease but just not as effective as the Egypti. Tom, is the potency of the possible dengue virus, is it, is it any more dangerous in the maturity level of a mosquito? So either, either a young mosquito or one that's fully adult? Uh, you know, I don't have the answer to that. Okay. Uh, definitely uh, something we can reach out to our, uh, our subject matter experts uh, with CDC to get that answer for you. One question, how about if people have fish ponds at their, their residential areas? What, what do you recommend that they do in order to cover their pond right. or whatnot. Excellent question. Uh, that'll depend actually on the size of the pond. Of course, um, the larger the pond, if you will, the body of water, less likely the, the 80 species will lay its eggs there. They're primarily a artificial container breeder, uh, so they lay their eggs. They like small bodies of water, if you will, like what you find in tires and container, artificial containers. Uh, they don't generally uh, lay their eggs, if at all, in the large bodies of water. But of course, uh, if you want to share them, what do we do for ornamental ponds uh, that we may find in a common house? Claire, you want to share how this is right. done? The most effective way to get rid of mosquitoes and break the life cycle is to dump out any body of water, a small body of water that um, ADs like. Um, for ponding basins, generally that's an Anopheles species that particularly likes laying eggs in that area. But for the 80s um, mosquito, they like small containers. So the best information that we can give you is to dump out the, the standing water. Right. And if it's something you can't obviously remove, such as flower pots, uh, drains, is just simply clean them or replace the water as, as necessary, like for your pets, right? You have uh, water for your pet. And we ask that you change like every five, seven days, put new water in to Even replace more, it. Even more often than that. Right. The 80s mosquito lays its eggs and it will hatch within seven days. So I would say three days, Chief, would be the best, at least every other day if you want to be um, a really effective, just mm -hmm. dump it out as much as you can. And if you can't um, dump it out, then you can apply something called BTI, which is a biological control. We suggest that for tires and larger containers, like um, rain catchments, um, especially if you use that water. Right. And the larva side is, com is available in your, your, your local hardware stores. Uh, they're generally harmless. Uh, doesn't require, there's no restrictions. Essentially, anyone can purchase them uh, over the counter, if you will. Uh, and it's simple to apply, and it's, and it's very effective in killing mosquito larvae. Yes. This is the one that's dispensed with like the spray nozzle, right? Uh, no. It actually comes in granules. Oh, it's, actually, oh, it's, it's green. Okay. Yeah, I can show you a okay. sample yeah, of it. I don't want to uh, pick any particular brand, but let me just fold it. Maybe cover the brand there. <laughs> so it looks like this. This is the actual mosquito dunk. You should read the back because this is actually for a large scale application. Maybe for a rain catchment or a tonki, you can use about an eighth of this, but the instructions will be on the back. It also comes in a bottle um, as granules, so that's an easier application. And also the homeware stores and like hardware stores should be able to have that. Yes. Okay. Um, hopefully they've restocked. I know people are are trying to be proactive and act upon the issues with the dengue going around. But hopefully, I, I, I hope that the, all the hardware stores have restocked. Them. And if people just, um, uh, for consumers that go there and they want to say, I saw something on the live stream and I, I want to know specifically the chemical, the ingredient is BTI? BTI. BTI, OK. Yes. Yeah. OK, let's move on to the laboratory now. Do you have any questions about the traps that we use? So yes, oh go ahead. Okay. 
So normally this is a restricted area to the public, uh, but for the benefit of uh, the public and for you all, we wanted to show you exactly what we do here at the Mosquito Lab and to demonstrate our efforts in responding to the outbreak. Uh, so as the science says, we do take precautions to ensure the, any live mosquitoes that are brought here or, or grown here, if you will, reared here, if you will, um, are, we take every precaution to ensure it stains in this, beyond this room. Mm -hmm. So no live mosquitoes go out. Am I correct right there? Yes. Okay. okay. So with that, I'll, oh, I'd like to also mention, um, this construction of this facility has been made possible through a capital improvement project grant that came from uh, U.S. Department of Interior. Uh, Office of Insular Affairs. So because of their funding and support, we've been able to build this facility. Okay. So I'm sorry, just real quick. So for people that may be watching this and they may be thinking, oh man, Wedding Hill Elementary is like literally right across the street from this facility. They should not worry at all about mosquitoes getting out. Or Absolutely correct. We okay. do everything within, uh, everything within our ability and ability at the facility to ensure any live mosquitoes in there do not leave. Okay. And with that, let me open the door and Claire will lead you the way. So this is our ante room. It, it is a, a secondary um, um, a, a room, actually, that uh, helps us keep mosquitoes here. So it's a barrier against having them escape if they come out of these rooms. So this room, this ante room, leads to three different uh, additional rooms. This is our sorting and rearing room. Um, the, the ID is a little bit wrong on the room, but <laughs> we've had to um, make it work for us. So this is where we do our sorting ID, I mean sorting room, and this is where we do our identification. And then this is where we do our ramp, which is our um, pathogen testing. Okay, so I'll bring you into the first room that we go into. So Claire, maybe you want to explain to them exactly the steps the so this is the procedure. Yes. Okay. okay, so when we go out into the field, we collect mosquitoes, whether they be um, adult mosquitoes, uh, larvae, pupae, or eggs. We, all br we bring them all here and we process them, whether they're for a routine surveillance or a dengue response or any mosquito-borne disease response. So we bring them here and this is where we would process them. Take them here first. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. It's a small room, um, but a lot of work happens in this room. This is one of the primary rooms for our facility. So uh, when the our environmental technicians bring in the samples, they either put the live mosquitoes, the adult mosquitoes that they catch, and they knock them down. And knock, by knock down, I really mean kill. <laughs> and so that's done by putting them in the freezer for at least two hours. And that's, um, that's, after that's done, they are processed and put, uh, processed means killed, um, and they are brought over for identification. So that's the quickest way we can do identification is by collecting adults. Now, we also process larvae and eggs. So when we get the eggs, it's in a paper, and I'll show you that over here. Let me show you that first. And I can show you actually an ovicup. So if the public sees this out and about, this is called an ovicup. It really is just essentially a cup. <laughs> but the difference is inside um, is a germination paper. It's what we use. You can use any type of paper. And inside is a water, that stinky water that I showed you in the, oh, yeah. that room. Well, that goes in here, and the mosquitoes love it. And this is particularly for 80s, um, uh, um, 80s mosquitoes. So they lay their eggs inside. Let's see. They're very, very, very tiny. So. Um, no, actually, that's dirt in there, but let me, oh, see, if I can, <laughs> let me see if I can find you one that has eggs. So uh, right now we're just using this chamber as a place to dry the eggs. Now an important thing to know about Aedes albopictus or any Aedes species is that they love, um, they need to go through a drought period before they hatch. So just because you dump out the water doesn't mean that you still won't get Aedes because the eggs could be on the inside of the rim of the container. So in order to get rid of that, you would probably have to wipe down the inside of the container too or put something like maybe a, a low dilution of bleach to clean it, or even wash it with water and soap. 
So we take the germination paper and we lay it out to dry to um, simulate the drought. So once we put them through the drought, These are some eggs. They're very, very tiny. They look like black specks, but these are 80 species eggs. Yeah, Not like to be confused with the dirt. <laughs> okay. So when they um, when they go through this drought, they think that a drought. They think that it's um, it's dry, and then we um, revitalize them by adding water. So now we'll go over here. Would you like to explain to what this device does? Yes, it does. This is actually called an environmental chamber. It really is just a big room to incubate and mimic the environment that we have outside, but in a controlled manner. So it's called an environmental chamber. We set it at a specific temperature, which is outside, <laughs> and we try to keep the humidity the same as outside. And they also the day and night cycle is very similar to right. what you find outdoors. Right. So this is set. For, um, for the sun to come up and the sun to come down so that it, we try to mimic the same hours because we want to at least control, try to mimic everything to have the same control. So these are called rearing chambers oh, and you can smell. see, yeah, it's a, a musty smell yeah, that, and smells. that's because we have a, a little bit of water down here to keep that humidity high. I can't. Oh yeah, you have to come on this side. If I go under anything. Yeah. Good. How's that? Is that okay, everybody? Okay. So you can see we have some samples here. Um, um, what we do is we take those germination papers, we um, put them in some water, some clean water, and then we feed them um, a little bit of liver powder and. Um, sugar, I think it's sugar, when they're adults, but um, we put them in here and then they hatch. So, so you can see here, you can see the larvae uh, wiggling in, around in between the papers. About, about how many mosquitoes are in each one of those containers? Oh, that's a good question. It, it varies. It depends how many eggs are laid in each, each of them. Uh, we have a hatch rate about, of about 30%. Um, which is a pretty good hatch rate compared to um, other places. Um, and the point of doing all of this is to identify the species that are that are laying the eggs in these oviposit traps. Okay. But like I said, um, the species will most likely be some 80 species that likes container breeding because the oviposit cup is a small artificial container. So what that happens is um, they're fed and then they go through the life cycle and you can see how some of them are trapped in there, but they'll make their way up, just like this one. And then this is when they come up through this chamber, the top chamber of the rearing chamber, um, this is when we knock them down and, and kill them. <laughs> and then we process them to go and be identified. Okay? I just want to grab a photo. mosquitoes, what do you do after that? After, well, like, what do you do with that knowledge? How, how is that knowledge applied to what's happening currently? Well, it helps us build up uh, what our density is here on Guam, what, uh, and what type of species are currently on Guam. Right now, we're trying to build our repository of mosquitoes because this, um, even though the Mosquito Surveillance and Control Program has been running, it's just been recently that we've, we've been able to dedicate enough staff and resources to it to sustain it to this level. Um, so I, I'm proud to be working here um, because we've come a long way from where it was. Um, so with that information, we do the primary thing is we do is uh, identification of the mosquitoes. Okay. And what do we know at this point? What types of mosquitoes have been out in the Swamp Road area and in the Mihau area? The um, it's suspect? the same type of mosquitoes that we find everywhere, but the primary. Um, vector that we see or mosquito species that we see is Aedes albopictus and um, Chief mentioned earlier it is capable of transmitting the disease
but it isn't as competent as Aedes aegypti. And the reason being is Aedes aegypti loves to primarily feed on um, humans. So it'll, and it's, it's um, conditioned itself through evolution to avoid getting swat. And by, by doing that, it, um, it keeps going to different people and biting them. And so that's how it spreads the disease very quickly. Now for Aedes albopictus, it's a little bit different. They're not particular on what um, organism they feed on. So they'll feed on the lizard, a chicken, a pig, a dog, a human, and that essentially almost breaks that life cycle or that possibility to transmit the disease. What is the life cycle of the dengue virus? If once a mosquito bites, someone who's infected, how long can that mosquito for uh, transmit the disease. You know, I don't really know that information, but I believe it's for its lifetime. If it's a lifetime of the mosquito. If it's, uh, it's for, for the dengue virus will remain within the, the virus will remain within the mosquito for the lifetime of that particular mosquito. And the life cycle, uh, life, the lifespan of an adult mosquito, as we learned from uh, recently from Dr. Hancock, CDC, a, uh, tech, um, subject matter expert, is about a month. So you can have an adult mosquito that's infected with the dengue virus for approximately a month. But it would vary also right. with the mosquito. We have mosquitoes that live for a month. We have mosquitoes that live for two years. Uh, so it really depends on the species of the mosquito. So uh, like a different, different genus also can, can um, live longer. Sheets going out to the community. You've talked about, um, you know, you're, you guys have encouraged the community to reduce the amount of possible breeding grounds. How effective is that when you're talking about containing a virus that's already possibly out of the community? Well, first of all, you want to contain the infection to its area that's where we know that it's that we're having the uh, the clusters of dengue uh, cases. Uh, so, contain is important. Uh, and of course, removing, possibly eliminating that particular vector from that area, prevent it from spreading further out. So the key is, of course, containment and, uh, and management of the, the area of interest, the area of surveillance. And I know you guys have already sort of answered this for the Guam Daily Post, but I wanted to kind of get some clarification. There was um, the two first imported cases of dengue. I know you guys did some studies, but at that point, why wasn't it, uh, why wasn't there this sort of containment. Well, because it was imported, uh, the the we didn't elevate the the uh, response, but still, of course, we did our usual surveillance. Meaning, we visited the, the the patient, we conducted an interview, we examined the assessed the facility or the the house or the area that he or she resides, and also where he, she maybe spend other time. So we do conduct. Uh, we mean the Department of Public Health, does, we do conduct epidemiological investigation as well as we conduct our staff at the Division of Environmental Health surveillance of the site. And uh, as I mentioned, we have not had a dengue fever or we, as the Department of Public Health has mentioned several times, we have not had a dengue fever in the past 25 years. Uh, we always had imported cases over those past 25 years and so we've been responding accordingly and we focus on the area of interest. Uh, we focus on source reduction and of course, encourage individual to remain indoors. Uh, but uh, of course, we had the locally acquired cases, which uh, caused us to heighten our surveillance and response. And considering that you now have 10 local cases, or not 10 local cases, excuse me, 10 cases locally, uh, three of which I believe were reported, and seven of which were local. But because we've had that, is there a consideration of maybe doing the inspect insecticide spraying at I mean, across the island, or, or at least in larger, right. larger areas, because of, you so, know. Valid question. Uh, we, we at Division of Health, we implement what's called a, uh, integrated mosquito uh, management. So it's not a single focus, but a uh, multi-pronged approach. So we do source reduction, like elimination of the breeding sites, okay. okay? We do education, we do surveillance, and of course we do control. And control does include spraying, but spraying is not the only option, nor is it the last option. Right, absolutely. Uh, and the consequence, of course, of utilizing pesticides too much, we're concerned about pesticide resistance that might develop within the mosquito community. So we're trying to minimize that by, by using pesticide and applying them judiciously. 
so it's depending on the scenario and situation. Right now, we're trying to contain the infections to where we identify them. Uh, of course, we will adjust with the, uh, as if, if it progresses and continues. But right now, we're focused on containment and focusing those areas of surveillance. But I will say that the Division of Environmental Health, we've been, doing conduct, we've been conducting mosquito surveillance for the past year, uh, various sentinel sites. Uh, but just now, we're focusing those particular area where are particularly where we identify the, uh, the dengue cases. Was that year-long effort or this past year's effort a direct uh, reaction to maybe what's happening in the region? Or was that just something that public health does regularly or tries to do regularly? Right. Surveillance is a regular occurrence. We do it every day. Uh, we have uh, different sites throughout the island. Uh, we focus on those areas which were maybe deemed uh, a high risk or act as a sentinel site, like an early warning system. And that includes like ports of entry and the hospitals and certain areas that are the highly pop densely po uh, populated. So we do that um, regularly. Just right now, our focus has been diverted particularly to these uh, areas of interest, what we call areas of surveillance, based on the recent uh, positive cases of dengue. Right. Where, Where were the imported cases from? Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I believe they were, uh, you know, I was, apologize, I would have to refer that to our epidemiology team. Uh, we are the environmental health team. Our focus is on the uh, surveillance and the epidemiological studies are done by a different team. So this is a, a definitely a group effort, when I say group, the entire governor of Guam. And of course, we seek the, uh, support, the, the assistance of the public by, by basically performing the recommendation that we provide. Everything from bite protection to elimination of breeding sites. And out of the seven locally acquired cases, we know one was at Agueda, one was at Orden, Orden Chong, Talon Pago, Dedado. Um, where, where were the other four cases? Uh, I'll leave that to our epidemiological team to answer. Uh, like I said, uh, our focus right now with our operations team is surveillance, and, uh, and that's what we've been focusing on for the past week. I know that you guys have been going out doing community outreach, particularly and specifically focused on uh, Swamp Road as well as Indigo as well as Minino. How those areas we, you, you guys have talked about spraying within 200 meters, a 200 meter radius of the uh, residents. Has that area widened, uh, or well, have there been more people than originally? Um, sorry, more residences than originally anticipated. Well, let me first explain why 200 meters. Claire, would you like to share with, the, with everyone why we're utilizing 200 meter radius? Um, the mosquito has a, a range of two, from 100 to two, 400 meter radius. So we, uh, we use uh, CDC and WHO recommendations, and that's generally the, um, the radius that we are concerned with. Also, we have to consider the amount of manpower that we have. Is there any concern of residents perhaps not reporting? Uh, they might just be sick and, and consider that they just have a bad flu? Right, the current recommendation we've been giving out is that if you, if you have any of the symptoms of dengue fever is to go see your healthcare provider immediately. What about folks that perhaps don't have insurance? What would you recommend to them? Uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I believe they are afforded the opportunity to go to our uh, community health center, but of course that will need to be referred to the uh, the epi team, the epidemiological team. So I'm sorry if I can't answer all the questions. Since you guys are taking care of the surveillance part, the first one was in Chalon Pablo, the second one was in Dededo. Is there a reason for the difference in, in area? Where they were? Right, that's, that's part of the surveillance, uh, part of capturing the mosquitoes, uh, and also running uh, pathogen tests. And eventually, these results will be for CDC for con confirmatory tests. And especially if we were to do a screening test and identify that there are pathogens, we'll do some genotyping, or the CDC will, and see if there's any kind of link at all. You know, with ours, with the outbreak, and possibly the outbreak that's occurring in another area. Kind of following up on that um, risk question, are there concerns that there are asymptomatic, uh, or folks with it who are asymptomatic who are just walking around not knowing? Mm -hmm. Yes, well, it's, uh, as I'm not sure if any if you, if you guys participated or attended Dr. Dane Hancock, the CDC uh, Public Health uh, Service. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's assigned to public health to assist our in this response. Uh, he did a presentation on that, and as I can't recall the data, the number he gave, but there are definitely some asymptomatic, very likely there are asymptomatic individuals 
uh, who don't show the symptoms and doesn't may not be aware that they have the infection. But if I may, if we can continue on to yeah. show the other areas. Well, can that I ask a quick question? I know we know of the um, immediate symptoms, but are there any long-term effects? Uh, I'll let the, uh, the epidemiologist and the medical yeah. medical professional to answer that question. Yeah. But I'm more than happy to answer. We do the surveillance. Yeah, we don't have. Uh, we're not the professionals as far as clinical symptoms and effects of dengue, so they would be better um, informed, if they can better inform you on those issues, yeah. So with that, would I take you to the next room? So we primarily use um, uh, dissecting microscopes to view the mosquito, and we use the characteristic, the morphological characteristics of the mosquito to go through something called a dichotomous key. And this key tells you, does it have this or this? If not, then go to number five, and that's how we determine what the mosquito is. Um, there are times where we can't identify the mosquito, and so we have a whole gamut of people to assist us in doing that. WRBU, CDC, um, a lot of people. Sorry, what is WRBU? That's the Walter Reed Biosystematics Unit, uh, which is um, out of the Smithsonian. They, they are housed at the Smithsonian. Okay, so um, we have our, our, our EPHOs, um, look through the microscope. I don't have one set up for you, um, but it's uh, really interesting. You don't think that they look like that in the in the uh, microscope, but um, they're quite interesting. They have scales on them that have a different pattern, and that's how we kind of figure out what they are. So if I can get over here, I can show you our small repository of samples. Go down again. <laughs> Species that we have collected on Guam. Oh. Wait a minute. <laughs> Which they're, is not they're in there, right? Yes, they're in there. <laughs> right there. I see the needles. I see the needles. So they're difficult to pin. I imagine trying to pin something oh, wait, on a sorry. little can I, I can show you more on the other species. This is all eighties. Uh, we don't want to pin a whole bunch of them for for a specific species. But, oh um, yeah. They're like pinned straight up, too. Oh, okay, this is, this is our other species, Culix. Culix kinky fasciatus is our primary vector here in Guam, or not vector, but mosquito species on Guam that we've collected so far. Ooh. <laughs> I'm so close to Don't worry, them. they're not alive. We have one of uh, this oh, one. This is one. Anopheles. And for the question about the ponding basin, uh, this is the mosquito that would be living in the ponding basin, the most likely mosquito. Oh, this one? Yes. Are you guys surveying the, the ponding <clears throat> basins too as well then? We have sites that are near standing water, but um, the BG trap really is essentially for monitoring Aedes. And our MO is kind of like to keep Aedes aegypti off Guam. Um, we don't currently have any record of them being on Guam, recent record at least, and so our means uh, of operation is to prevent their, their, the population um, coming to Guam and, and, and um, breeding, and then we have a resident species that we don't want. How do you do that? How do you prevent a mosquito from... Well, there, there really is no way, but at least we monitor the ports of entry, and we also monitor um, the hospital. So that will, if they're going to establish anywhere, those will likely be the first areas that they would establish in. So we have a few more. We have a, actually a new mosquito species that was found um, about two years ago, but it isn't a mosquito, a, a vector of concern. It's just a nuisance mosquito, which is called Myomia michelii. So it just shows that there are species out there that we haven't caught. So um, hopefully Aedes is not one of, Aedes aegypti isn't one of them. So not if, anything, well, if anything, I think our, our surveillance shows that we are able to basically 
capture mosquitoes and identify them. Yeah. Our staff has been trained. Uh, we were able to identify this particular, it's not a new species per se, but it's new that have been identified here on Guam. Mm -hmm. It's not, a, it's, not a, it's, a, it's a mosquito, not a public health interest. As Clara said, it is a nuisance mosquito. Uh, but I think it just shows you our capability in, in capturing and identifying mosquitoes, such as the new species on Guam that we identify, which may be a fairly recent uh, um, arrival because it hasn't been documented in the past, correct? Mm -hmm. So would that conclude, uh, Claire, the, uh, the steps and process of the mosquito identification? And I, I, I've got a question, Tom, if I may. Um, how concerned are you about the, obviously you're doing like a lot of data collection, a lot of classification, but um, what chance is there for possible like uh, false positives or f like false negatives as far as like classifying like these mosquitoes and possibly, you know, just, just getting one wrong? First of all, our, our staff has been trained in mosquito identification. They've been trained in running the, uh, the ramp machine, which is to utilize to, to uh, identify pathogens, in this case, dengue virus. But of course, these are screening uh, and to get confirmatory results, especially for the RAM test, uh, we do send them off island. In fact, we are in the process of sending them to CDC uh, to get a confirm confirmatory uh, uh, test and results from them. Mm -hmm. So multi multiple checks for per case. Oh, right, right. As, as, as I mentioned, we do a screening or uh, preliminary testing uh, for dengue virus in these mosquitoes, but of course we will send them off island to get confirmatory okay. results. Okay. Is Dr. Hancock still on island? Uh, I believe he is. Okay. So he continues to work with you guys? Oh, definitely. Uh, Dr. Hancock has been a great asset in our not dengue uh, response. Um, is there, has there been any discussion, uh, meeting of the minds between Guam, CNMI, uh, which has also reported some imported cases, um, um, right. Well, the surveillance of the region are shared regularly uh, to, a, to, a, to a surveillance system. Uh, we get the results as well occasionally. Um, currently, our focus, of course, has been on Guam, but a lot of other areas they've been focusing their own challenge, I mean, having their own response uh, and addressing their uh, dengue uh, cases on their respective islands. We do meet periodically every month with all of the region. So um, uh, we have other islands, CNMI, um, Koshrai, Yap, um, Chuk. We have, um, um, we do collaborate with them and part with, partner with them. And we always, um, during these monthly meetings, which is called the Pacific Island Vector and Management Council, we, um, we collaborate and we talk about how we can have a strategic plan for the region. And also we report our results in our surveillance on each island. So it's a, it's a regional effort at this point. And are you working with the military? Do you guys, do they have a lab? Um, I believe that they do have some type of mosquito. Um, they do collect mosquitoes. I do know that. Um, and I, I believe that they send them off island for identification. But we do, we have reached out to them. And they have been one of the partners that we've been working with. OK, Claire or Tom, I, I don't know which of you wants to answer this. Just a really quick question. I know you guys called the media over here for a quick overview of what you guys are doing. Um, but what is the, Tom, can you come over here? Oh, sure, I'm sorry. Get together, so. I'll give a spotlight to Claire. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think she should be credited for all the hard work my staff been doing in this mosquito lab and out in the field. Right. Uh, I mean, you, know. you guys, have, your, your people have been out to Department of Public Health and Social Services. You guys have been out um, all weekend for the last couple weekends, yes. in fact, doing a lot of work. Um, so kudos to you guys for that. Thank you. You know, um, at this point, you know, what is the one message you want? What do you want people to take from today's visit here to the right. lab? Right. Excellent question. Uh, this this emergency response that's being as ongoing currently. This is not just a public health uh, response. This should be a community-wide response. That means everyone on this island should participate and do their part. And and one, of course, is to break the mosquito life cycle by removing the breeding sites. And that can be simply done on their homes, around their homes and neighborhood, uh, keeping the area sanitary. And of course, uh, prevent from being bit and thus minimize the spread of the infection. So we encourage the public to do their part in protecting themselves, uh, maintaining sanitation around their premises. And uh, of course, if they feel that they are uh, possibly infected or concerned, and have the symptoms noted for dengue virus to see their healthcare provider, so they can be so they can be detected and treated early. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks
slide, guys. So, um, yes, uh, so this is our Mosquito Lab. Uh, as I said, um, I wanted to share with you and the public uh, what we do uh, in the lab. Uh, we're known primarily for our field work, uh, but we have now expanded our capability to the lab as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. So we will escort you out to that way. Uh, I apologize for the humidity and the heat okay. trying to make certain rules. Right, that's condition. Okay. So, uh, Claire, if you'd like to lead, lead the group. Okay, so we are being let out by our friends at uh, Public Health on a very informational tour here. I'm Jason Salas alongside uh, Adriana Cotero, who you were just looking live at the, uh, what's known as the Mosquito Lab, maybe a little bit affectionately for people in the business, but more, um, more formerly Adriana, the Guam Environmental uh, Public Health Facility in Dededo, right across from Wedingale Elementary. For those of you who may be wondering um, about the situation, um, they said there is no chance um, all precautions are taken, all safety measures um, have been considered, and they are following all protocols to make sure that, that the mosquitoes that are under testing right now. That's right, we got to like, yeah. take a look at the different traps that they have. Yeah, that they won't. Addition, and they did say that there's no way that these mosquitoes will be let out of that lab. Okay, so uh, we just do want to get you, whoops, my camera are we on? Okay. Okay, so we do want to get you guys up to speed on uh, the other events related to uh, the dengue situation right now on Guam. What we have reported is, as of last night, six new cases, Adriana, were confirmed by our and friends at Public Health. schools will be closed as of tomorrow. Yes, that is Augusta Johnston um, Middle School, Orta Chalampago Elementary School, and now Harvest uh, Christian School. They will say Harvest is going to be sprayed tomorrow, thus the need to close that school. So if you are from Augusta, or to Chalampago or Harvest, classes have been canceled for you. We've got all the information on KUM.com right now. This was a very informative uh, Extremely tour. Extremely informative, and as they mentioned, just make sure you take your own necessary precautions, spraying yourself, getting rid of water, and um, just making sure that you're staying alert this time. Okay, so for Adriana Cotero, I'm Jason Salas. Thank you so much for joining us on this live stream. Please be safe, Guam. <laughs>